Okay, my friends, this is very interesting because I have a, a, a pretty good history of research on this. No medical advice whatsoever, just research about autism and changes that happen related to the microbiome. They say it's linked to changes in the gut microbiome, just out today, 9 of July 2024. One of the most detailed studies yet has cemented the link between autism and what dwells within the gut. Cemented the link. There's a link there, and, and this is what we had found in the research I was doing, but it, it, as, as you will see, it's, it's rejected. This is disturbing, I'm going to tell you the truth. It says the new analysis hasn't just studied the bacteria, which was primarily what I was looking at, because the bacteria create the enzymes. So they didn't just didn't study the bacteria that is native to the digestive tract, and everybody has thousands and thousands of different strains. They also looked at the fungi, the archaea, and viruses that can be found there too. All right, now, the team was led by researchers in Chinese University Hong Kong developed a comprehensive assay that reveals a correlation between changes across the entire gut microbe and diagnosis with autism spectrum. Now, let's just talk about the microbiome. How does it work? Why in the world would having different bacteria in your gut have, have an effect on the way autism responds in people and other people don't have it? All right, this is what upset me about they want to take Netflix. They tell them to t take down this, this documentary about the gut problem linked to autism and it, it, as far as I can see it, it has a very strong association now the guy that's in charge of the whole thing says it's not a t it's not a disease or a temporary symptom li or linked to the gut health and it cannot be treated or cured I'm not saying cured but if you can make the symptoms less severe and that is what appears to be the case. Now, I have Marguerite and have the people she's worked with comment, and she will comment about her own son and her about her grandson. It's everywhere over there in Northern Ireland. It's just everywhere. And it's bad. They're real bad. Her son was in a desperate situation. Anyway, this won't be my words, and I never recommend cures or do this or don't do that. I am not a doctor. So please... Um, YouTube do not take this down or deny this to be seen because this is how research starts this is how cures are discovered by not talking about them and saying no you shouldn't say this you shouldn't say that let's look at the research and this is what I show as material research so get ready because you're going to see why I say this has some potential and that's all I'm saying I'm not saying it's a cure for anything and again, I'm not saying do this or do that. Research on it. All right. This is about autism spectrum disorder, ASD. And th they did a bunch of studies, they claim. And here's what they found. Listen to this. This is crazy. ASD who experienced GI issues ranging from 9 to 91%. From nine to nine, it is more up to the ninety-one percent rate. Everybody, virtually everybody that I talked to, said that their kids had some kind of digestive issue, and mostly it was diarrhea, and they were all wearing diapers still nine years old and beyond, and nonverbal, all kinds of issues. Now, a 2021 review of 144 studies published between 1980 and 2017 found the median rate of GI symptoms in people with ASD is 47%. Well, that's half of them, they claim. Now, when they say gastrointestinal disorder, you know, how do they, they assess exactly what that is? I can tell you what it is. It's when you di don't digest correctly and you have gas or or bloating, or constipation, or diarrhea, or vomiting, or acid reflux, or gut distress of any nature, pain, and so forth. You have to have the right bacteria to create the right enzymes to attack the foods coming through you, and then it just gets done. And then you have the right chemistry. All right, the reason they did this study 
was to advance the understanding of autism, obviously, but primarily it sounds to me like they were looking for markers. And what is a marker? A marker says that if this guy's got this certain type of gut bacteria, he's probably got autism, or he's going to have autism spectrum disorder. They have it now focused pretty good on what these different, different, um, I just showed you the archaea, the bacteria, the fungi, all that stuff. They know pretty much what's different in an autism kid versus a non-autism kid. So they're looking for these markers to say, yep, he's got autism. Let's do whatever we do with a person with autism. So that's what they're talking about. But it is, it does show you clearly that there is a total, look, here's the difference. Integrated analysis reveal 14 archaea, 51 bacteria, 7 fungi, 18 viruses, 20 micro, 27 micro, microbial genes, 12, 12 metabolic pathways are altered in children with autism. All right, and it, it, it's a panel of 31 multifunctional functional markers showed up. What we need to do is to have a database so that all you need is a fecal swab, because that's how they got this. This is, a, this is from a fecal swab. This is not rocket science. This is, to me, this is very simple, and it would get more and more sophisticated as you went forward and created new processes to do it with, probably just take a picture of, of, of poop. And it would, you know, you'd have to have something on there that had all the frequencies of light, because all these different frequencies of light correspond to all these different particles of, of matter. And all those different particles of matter correspond to what bacteria are in there. So if you take a picture of the light and it shows all these different frequencies and the number of this exact frequency here is related to lactobacillus acidophilus and you know whatever there's going to be some way to identify them with light and all we need to do is if this works is to take a picture of it and we say he's got this kind of bacterial profile this is the right one we're missing the yellow the blue and the green what is that it's this type and this type and this type and you fix the kid. All right, I haven't read it. I just clicked on it and let's see what the learning disability today. Netflix urged to take down deeply irresponsible documentary linking autism and gut health. All right, they're saying the National Autistic Society says it's deeply irresponsible and offensive. Now, autism is referred to as a disease Autism is mentioned several times throughout the program. In the opening sequence, we hear autism referred to as a disease. Well, yes. When the presenter says diseases like anxiety and depression, cancer, autism, Parkinson's are all related to the gut. I agree with that statement 100%. Who cares if you call it a disease or not? This, this is deeply offensive to me, that they find this one word offensive. Now, the National Autistic Society highlights that autism is a lifelong, no it's not, it doesn't have to be, disability. Words like disease suggest something is wrong with someone and it can be cured. Well, maybe it can be. They think it can't be. They, they've already given up the ship. National Autistic Society, well, you can't cure that. Huh? It's just not appropriate when talking about autistic people, the charity said. The charity, this is where they get their money, the charity said. Links between autism and gut health not backed up by scientific evidence. Well, let's see the scientific evidence and see. Later on, John Sura, neuros neuroscientist, University College says, co-occurrences co of gut problems with brain problems are very common. Yes, it's a gut-brain axis. And he specifically mentions autism in relation to this. One thing I'm really interested in is when we have co-occurrences of gut problems with brain problems. And it's very common. It's very common in autism. It's almost 100%. Also in Parkinson's disease, but also in stress-related psychiatric illnesses, also cancers, also all kinds of diseases. Anxiety, depression, and anxiety and depression, a lot of that is linked to constipation for some reason. That's what I have heard from people that I have talked to. And the other side of that is um, diarrhea. 
and um, and you know loose stool let's call it that diarrhea that causes other things but the anxiety and depression usually they talk about um, constipation anyway and so which came first is always the question was it you're sick and that caused your gut distress or was the gut distress what caused the sickness I say it's the gut distress and, it's, and it is backed up by scientific evidence. So whoever wrote this was not being realistic. All right, so Tim Nichols, head of the Influencing Research National Autistic Society, highlights that not only the problematic use of brain problem in relation to autism, but also that this link is causally made. Well, some causes it, and not backed up by any scientific evidence. That's just not true. While well, Jack Gilbert, a microbial, microbial ecologist, mentions that he has undertaken research which found that in many cases of autism there are children that have diarrhea or severe constipation. No further information about this research is given because nobody will go into the research they, every single time. And this is even the people that should want to see this research, which is the, um, uh, what, the National Autistic Society. They're, it sounds like to me that they're just against looking into this. It says the documentary also discussed fecal microbiota transplants. Yes, I've been looking at that for years, which involves transferring healthy bacteria in a mixture of prepared processed stool from a healthy donor to an intestine of the patient. And they have found that that does, the research says it does work. In the United States, FDA approved the FT, FMT for reoccurring clostridic difficile, but researchers are now looking into whether the therapy could work for conditions including autism and cancer, all right, and Parkinson's, and dementia. It's, it's, it controls your entire body is this microbiome. Every single thing that's done in your body requires an enzyme, a hundred percent. Every chemical reaction in your body, one hundred percent requires an enzyme to break down and process things or to attack invaders or to build things out of proteins which is to make your body work build up or to destroy food coming in to break it down so you can absorb it or to create chemistry that clicks on and, and destroys invaders all right it's all done by bacteria enzymes and that chemistry and it works so fast that there's nothing in the universe that works faster. You can do up to a million years of chemistry within one second. Only if you have the enzyme. And the enzyme and it reconstructs all kinds of molecules into food supplements so that, so that it'll work for you. You can't just eat a carrot and it turns into a muscle. This doesn't happen. You need some next thing you know you got a muscle. Only done by bacterial enzymes. Alright, you know when I do something I just keep digging deeper and deeper and I ran into this. Learning disability today. So they're all about learning disabilities. Now, this is about Netflix was urged to take down deeply irresponsible documentary linking autism and gut health. And it sounds like these people are supporting the, the National Autistic Society described a new Netflix documentary links autism with gut health as deeply irresponsible and offensive. All right, now there's a guy that's in charge of of everything as far as this guy right here, Tim Nichols. He's the head of influencing and research at the National Autistic Society. So what does he do? He directs what are we going to think about? How are we going to research? What are we going to influence? Who are we going to talk to? He highlights, not, he highlights not only the problematic use of brain problem, of course it's a brain problem, in relation to autism, but also that this link is casually made and not backed up by any scientific evidence. It's backed up by staggering amounts. Here's another quote from Mr. Nichols. Autism is a lifelong disability, not a disease or a temporary situation linked to gut health and cannot be treated or cured. Let's not bother doing any research on it. Let's just try to figure out a way to make them comfortable. 
To suggest otherwise is wrong, deeply irresponsible, and offensive to autistic people and their families, he said. Well, Mr. Nichols, I think your comments are deeply offensive to me and the research that has been done, and you being in charge of research, I find you, Mr. Dis Mr. Disgraceful Nichols, to be disgraceful. And to attack Netflix for doing the work that you should be doing is even more disgraceful. I'd like to have Mr. Nichols address this. Multi-kingdom functional gut microbiota markers for autism spectrum disorder. They're looking to see if they can prove who's got autism and who doesn't. Because now it's sort of a, a dodgy deal. But what they did was they said, let's look at the gut microbiota. Guess what? Here it is right here. There's no question whatsoever. Integrated analysis revealed 14 archaea, 51 bacteria, 7 fungi, 18 viruses, 27 microbial genes, and 12 metabolic pathways were altered in children with autism disorder. That's a pretty obvious, it's, it, it's related, and they've always known this. It's just that apparently people like this Mr. Nichols in charge of research for autism has been standing in the way. This is, I find this is just unbelievable, and I found this right across the board. Anytime you come up with anything that disrupts a guy's apple cart, because he's in charge of it's a charity. People give a whole bunch of money, and they do whatever they want with it. I don't know what they're doing. They're not doing the research, as far as I can determine. I don't know. That's just my estimation. He doesn't seem to think any research is necessary. I don't know what they're doing. And I'd like to have some kind of explanation as to why this is not being looked into the way it should be. There is scads of research on this that it improves autism spectrum disorder. Not only that, they're finding out that fecal matter transplants for autism and, uh, well, autism, of course, and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and all that seems to have some effect. And again, I'm not saying do it, don't do it, who cares? I, it's up to you. You know, that, I'm presenting research. And they have found all of these are related to gut disorders, which are related to enzymes, which are related to chemistry, which are related to the ribosomes, which do the chemistry inside the cells. You don't have them, you are open for cellular damage. All right, I'm going to leave it at this. But they, they do understand there is some relationship here, and they should study it. So they're going to do that. Fecal microbiota transplant for patients with autism. And they're just starting. It just started, uh, the study starting just a few months ago. And uh, it aims at, to evaluate the efficacy of these transplants on gastrointestinal systems, of autistic symptoms and emotional behavior on a bunch of patients in their gut brain axis, cytokine storms, and all this. Now, they're hoping to complete this in about three years. That's. Uh, well, that's what it is. And, and they're going through a detailed analysis of what they're going to do. The purpose of the study is to treat patients with autism by fecal microbiota transplant and evaluate its e efficacy in gastrointestinal, autistic, emotion, and behavior symptoms. It aims to prove the correlation between a blood gain axis, intestinal microbiota, cytokines, and autism. Fecal matter transplant may improve and change the composition diversity of intestinal microbiota of patients and their immune reactions and subsequent improvement gastrointestinal autistic, autistic emotional behavior symptoms as well as sleep. Early intervention by FMT in children with autism may improve their cognition and hence result better prognosis. So now, right now we know these different, these different little things here. These different things that are in. So we can diagnose a kid that has autism. So we can intervene now. That's pretty important. That's a big deal. Because before we could just say, oh, yeah, well, he's just, because you, you don't start off just being totally in the autism spectrum sometimes. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. A lot of them, their microbiota gets damaged early in their first few years and then all of a sudden they just change. And what damages it? Well, there's a bunch of different things that we, we want to investigate, but it is primarily 
killing off the bacteria that's in the gut and then they can't come back from it and then they get this autistic disease which I call a disease because it is a disease it can be cured in my opinion I, I you know and especially if you can intervene early when you see these things are out of balance this is the key for this guy this Nichols guy to just say oh it's not it, it can't be cured I'm the research head and we're not going to read research. Sounds like to me they're not doing any research on it if he thinks it can't be cured. What would his sense be to do that? I'd like to see what research he is doing. If he's the head of research and influencing, what influence is he influencing? Very disturbing that they went after Netflix for talking about it. That's very disturbing to me. Okay, this is the bacteria that shoots out the ribosomes. These flow through everywhere in your body. There's more of them in you than there is your cells in you. They're everywhere. Those little balls that shoot out of those ribosomes are these little balls right here. They pop open when they get to their target and they create an enzyme which breaks down the fats or the carbohydrates, the sugars and all that stuff. Or also an enzyme kills an invader. It could also open up and have from, become a bacteria that says, I make things. And then out of that sheath would pop a protein, which is a builder, muscle, bones, whatever. And it's a, it's a building block. These are destroyers. These are builders. They come from the same source, which is a ribosome, but a different bacteria. This particular bacteria make a ribosome that breaks things. But a different bacteria has a different DNA program in it. See, it's got its own DNA program. It says, I'm going to make a ribosome too, but my ribosome is going to make bones. And another one says, mine is going to make skin, or whatever it is. They, there's a program in here that says, make this little molecule and send it out. And they're so tiny that one ribosome, that's, this is a single cell. These ribosomes are so small they are so tiny that in one single cell, like this one animal cell, you could have up to 10 million <laughs> of those ribosomes in here. They're so tiny, they're almost like nothing. However, when they open up and the enzyme pops out, they just get gigantic. That's why they can, the tiny little balls can flow through the body. Nothing stops them. The blood-brain barrier, psst, like it wasn't even there. They're so tiny, they're just nothing. Now, when they get into the cell, they are ready to do a, a job, but they're dead. They're not living, they don't poop, they don't eat, they just float around and wait to be called on. Now, what happens when they get called on? That little tiny ball, which I showed you before, this little ribosome, the sheath pops off. What pops out? Well, this doesn't do it credit because this is what they look like. All right, they originally start out with a little ball like this. It's all crunched together. But when it gets tickled on the surface of a certain chemistry that says, I am the guy that works with you one way or the other. You kill me or you make me build something, whatever. But as soon as it hits, it goes like that and then it becomes that enzyme. Now, if it's a killer enzyme, it has what's called click chemistry. It goes click, 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 and just kills it. They call them serial killers. <laughs> and it doesn't get used up. That's what's the beauty of an enzyme. And it does more chemistry in one second than could possibly happen in a million years in some cases. But it's, it's, it's a staggeringly long time it would take to do the chemistry that the enzymes do. Because the enzymes have all these little... They're called the half-lives of particles, which is also another thing that has to change, is dipole electron flood theory. In other words, hydrogen is not one single H, a big, big hydrogen like that. Hydrogen is 1825 or so of these little particles, which are all dipoles. And they're all over the place in here. You see these? These are the same things. These are all dipoles, red and blue, given the different charges basically and this has to fit into something else and it has to all these little dipole moments have to line up Pew. done and it, this is all a product this has been assembled literally assembled by a bacteria the bacteria make these chains of polypeptides hold on a second all right, I showed you the ribosome, that little tiny ball. It doesn't look like much, but guess what? 
this is how they get made. These are all the different amino acids. Now, amino acid is a complex little molecule. It's a, it's a very complex little molecule. And they are come out in all these, there's 20, I think, different amino acids. Now, they squirt them out in this polypeptide chain inside the bacteria into a ball. And it programs that ball to become a ribosome. The ribosome has the messenger RNA in it. All right, messenger RNA is not like DNA. It's half of DNA. And they go out laying around inside cells and they attach to the, the um, endoplasmic reticulum, the, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. See these little balls there, ribosomes? Well, they're all in here too. They're everywhere. There could be millions of them, 10 million of them in that cell. Every cell in your body has them. So something calls on those molecules to become active, whether it's something bumps into them or whether the lysosome, which I suspect is the lysosome, is there to turn them on to activate them. And somehow it has some chemistry that says, hey, we're getting invaded by such and such, turn on number 1257P, whatever they call themselves. And out of it goes and kills it. All right, and they can come in and out of here through the fluid-filled highway. There's a whole bunch of holes in these membranes, but they are very specific holes. They only allow certain things to go certain ways. Very, very sophisticated device. It's got to dump stuff out, and it's got to let stuff in. But only the right stuff can come in, and only the bad stuff should go out. And the membrane is what decides what comes in and goes out. And the membrane is made out of phospholipids. So you need a certain type of chemistry. You need to do a certain type of chemistry to do everything in your body. Everything. All right, I'm going to leave it at this. But as far as Mr. Nichols goes, being heading into research, he should take a look at this. This just came out, and they know these markers indicate you're going to have autism. If there's some way to intervene, and not just give up and say this is incurable, don't even think about trying to cure it. That's just not the way to think, my friend. They know all of this stuff right here is different in a kid with, back with uh, autism versus one that doesn't have it. Can we do anything about that? Can we just add these? I would try that. Let's see what happens. Can we take some of these away? All right, but I know that if you have the right bacteria, and I think it's almost always related to the right bacteria, because all the other stuff I think will fall into place if the bacteria is there to make the enzymes, to keep the fungi and the viruses at, at bay. You need all these things in your body, but some can become overwhelming. You have flesh-eating bacteria in you right now. There's no question whatsoever, 100% certainty. And you know why? Because it has to eat your dead flesh. You're dying, as we're talking right this instant, you are dying inside. And what happens to that dead flesh? A flesh-eating bacteria comes and chews it up into little bits and pieces, sends it out through wherever it goes, out through the lymph nodes or wherever, and is excreted out of the body. But you need that, that bacteria. But if you don't have something to say, hey, that's enough. You ate what you should eat, don't eat, don't keep going. Then you're okay. But if you don't have that thing, and he says, oh, I'm hungry, this is good stuff. And it says, oh, there's some over there. It doesn't look dead, but let's eat it anyway. And they do. And the next thing you know, it goes right through into your membranes and into your lungs or your liver or your kidneys or whatever. And then you get a cancer of that because it's an invasion through that membrane. Now, I'm going to leave it at that. But to give up, your, give up this ship and just con con consider this... Netflix take down this documentary. It's not a, it's, it, it'll never be cured. Oh, it's a lifelong disability. This is not what the, the, the research indicates. And if he really, if he really believes this, I'm, I'm shocked. Absolutely, totally shocked. All right, my friends, when I saw this, I was so buoyed by this. Oh boy, they're finally looking into this. Uh, the National Association for Autism must be thrilled about this. Look at this. Then I run into this, and I went off the rails, and I made some really nasty comments, but I, what can I say? This is only a couple months ago. This guy, Mr. Nichols, says it is disgraceful 
the Netflix has given a platform to a show which casually promotes dodgy, untested science about autism. Autistic people watching will have heard themselves talked about in the most stigmatizing and unacceptable ways. You know what else he says? This same guy here, he is in charge of research. He says that autism cannot be cured. It's a lifelong disease. I'll, I'm going to show you exactly what he says. It, and I, like I say, I went off the rails a little bit. I didn't mean to be quite as nasty as I was, but it's, I w was exactly what I was feeling. And I still feel.